falsely. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Satan has come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's where the evil comes from on the earth, not from God. He's the giver of life. And I thought, Lord, why didn't you pick me? He didn't give me an answer. So I have no idea why he would have picked me. You know, I was not a Billy Graham. I just was a realtor going to work like everybody else every day. You know, and I, I like everything neat and clean and perfect and hell is the antithesis. You know, uh, I know we all do, but I'm like a fanatic about these things. And, and um, I mean, I don't even like the summertime. That's too hot for me, you know. But I don't, it doesn't matter why he picked me. You know, he's given us all a job to do. Everyone has a job to do for the Lord. And no one is more important than anybody else. We're all equally as important. And you know, I was uncomfortable for seven years giving this testimony, extremely uncomfortable. And I complained. And the Lord said to me, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. I said, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. And he said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's job. You just go and tell them. And I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? Why didn't I know you? And he said, because if you would have known me, you would have had hope. And I wanted you to experience what they feel there, hopelessness. You see, if I was there as a Christian like I am, then I would have said, praise God, he's getting me out of here, right? I would have known I would not have to have stayed there. But he blocked it from my mind so that I could experience what those people feel, hopeless, hopelessness for all eternity. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know the truth is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Well, those people, Jesus is the only hope for us. And they have no hope for him. He's the only hope. They have no hope. It's too late for them. The decision's final. The worst part of hell, besides the pain and, and being separated from God and all his goodness, was to know that you'll never, ever get out. 10 million years will go by and you're still there suffering. We went out into space, all the way out into space, and I look back at the earth. It was so awesome to see the earth from space. I mean, it was absolutely glorious. I look back and I thought, wow, what's, what's holding that up? You know, Job 26, 7 says, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. It's like, what's holding it up? What's making it turn so perfectly at a thousand miles an hour and not varying even one mile per hour? And you know, when I was a child, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I believe God remembered that thought. And he says, he'll give us the desires of our heart. I mean, how, how great is that? And I could see all the vastness of the universe, the stars, the billions of stars. And I looked at them, I thought, oh Lord, you're in control of every one of them. And not one is colliding, not one is out of control. The billions of stars, he's controlling all that. All at the same time, I thought about all the people on the earth, the billions of people on the earth, that he knows every single thought that we're having in every single moment. Can you imagine a God that big? And he's running heaven and controlling everything with not one error anywhere. He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. He knows every hair that's on our head which changes daily, right? It's increasing for us men. I was just enjoying all that, God's glorious creation and His awesome power. But then He wanted me to see and remember. He had me turn around and I looked at the tunnel we just came out of. And people were falling one after another, after another, after another, back down the tunnel we just came out of. And He wept. Because it's not a desire for anybody to go there. Ezekiel 33, 11 says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And people were falling. And he wanted me to remember that. So I would go and witness. And I could not stand feeling. He allowed me to feel a piece of his heart. And it was so overwhelming to feel what God feels. His love, Ephesians 3, 19 said his love passes knowledge. It's way past our ability to even conceive how much he loves us. You know, God's not up there saying, oh, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. All of us, above the age of accountability, are already on our way to hell, automatically. You see, God came 
to get us off that road. And I like what Reinhard Bunke said. He planted a cross right in the middle of that road of all of us going to hell. So all we have to do is look up to that cross and be humble enough to admit we're sinners and call out on God. And He'll save us. We came back down on the earth and came up on my body and I, we were hovering above our, my house and I looked through the roof and I could see myself lying on the floor. It was so strange to look at my body. I thought, that's not me. This is the real me. It looked like if you were to get out of your car. It's just a vehicle to get you around in. It's not really you. That's how temporal the body looked. And then I saw a puff of smoke go up and I said, Lord, what's that? And he said, your life. I said, that's it? It was over in a second. Well, he said, James 4.14, life is but a vapor. It was so fast compared to eternity, like a little tea kettle with smoke going up. That's how short our life is compared to eternity. I thought, Lord, we don't have much time. And he said, yeah, but what you do for me during that time, I will count for all eternity. Isn't that awesome that God would do that? Praise the Lord. You know, that short time, if we, it gave me a better overall eternal perspective on life. What's important, really? Serving God is most important. Anyway, you know, you might be here and you might say, but Bill, I'm a good person. I'm not going to go to hell. There was a 2006 Barna poll that showed that 54% of Americans generally believe that if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. That's the common misconception because it's not based on being good. It's based on a relationship. You see, and it's a good thing it wasn't based on being good because none of us would get there. You see, you might be pretty good compared to people, but if you're going to go by that standard, you have to compare it to God's good. And God says, if, if you lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Just once. If you steal one thing, no thief will inherit heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. If you lust just one time, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery. No adulterer will inherit heaven. Just one time, because James 2.10 says, if you offend the law in one point, you're guilty of all. Well, that's just three of the Ten Commandments. If we're going to be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? We'd all be guilty, right? So there's a penalty to pay for our sin. But Jesus paid that penalty. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He paid it. You can either let him pay it or you can. But you see, you could never pay it because it took an eternal God and the blood of Jesus to pay for our sins. Time in hell would never suffice. You can't be in hell for 500 years and say, well, I paid, I worked off my sins. That would be a works trip, number one. And time would never suffice because we're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved by time. You might be like, I was on a radio talk show with... Um, one of the toughest radio announcers in the country. And he said, I submit to you that your God is unreasonable and unloving because he doesn't consider my viewpoints, only you Christians' viewpoint. That's unreasonable and unloving. He should let me into heaven because I'm a good person. And I said, let me give you an analogy. I said, say you went and knocked on the door of the most expensive home in the country. And you knocked on the door and you said, um, excuse me, I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? And you wouldn't expect them to because you have no relationship with them. The same way. You go through your whole life, you have nothing to do with God, you deny that Jesus is the Son of God, then at the end of your life, you come and knock on His door, and you say, uh, excuse me, I'm moving in with you. I'm a good person. It's not based on being good, it's based on a relationship. You have to know Him. And He offered Himself to be your Father, but you rejected Him over and over again. He's your creator, but he's not your father. Galatians 3.26, uh, Romans 9, 7 and 8, John 1.12, John 8.44, all explain that, that he's your creator, but he's not your father until you invite in Jesus into your heart, then he becomes your father. So who's the arrogant one expecting to live at a house where you don't even know the person? You have no right. He says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. And I said, well, let me give you another analogy. I said, say you invited me over to dinner, and you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. That's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I think I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. <laughs> uh, 
All right? And you're going to say, Bill, I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. Well, I think God knows where he lives. Right? He's given us clear directions. All we have to do is follow his directions. We'll get there. If we don't, we send ourselves to hell. That's not narrow-mindedness. That's specific. God is specific with his directions. And he said, well, if there's a God, how come there's so much evil in the world? I said, well, if there is no God, how come there's so much good in the world? Amen? Praise God. Where's all this good come from? He said, well, okay, so I'm a sinner. I'm not, that's not, I'm not that bad, though. I don't kill anybody. Can't God overlook my sins? Is what he said to me. And I said, no, he can't for two reasons. Number one, he's a just judge. And a good judge in our land would not be considered good if he let the criminal go free, would he? The crime has to be punished. Well, our sin has to be punished. And it was. Jesus took our punishment for us. So again, you can either let him take it or you can take it. But you'd have to pay for it for all eternity because you can never pay for sins. I said, but secondly, the second reason he can't overlook your sin is because Hebrews 12, 29 said God is a consuming fire. And what that means is, say you stuck your hand in the fire to retrieve something and it burned you. You wouldn't say, why did that fire burn me? That was mean in that fire. I didn't do anything to that fire. You wouldn't say that, would you? Why? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. You would expect it to. Your hand and fire are not compatible. Well, the same with God. God and sinful man are not compatible. See? And that's a problem for us. We are sinful. So we can't show up in His presence. We would be consumed because He's a consuming fire. You see that? So how can man ever stand before a holy God? Only one way. We would have to appear to be sinless. Well, how can that happen? Again, only one way. Someone would have to come and live a perfect life and never sin once. And that someone is Jesus. And stand before God and say, I've lived the perfect life. I'm going to exchange their sin for my righteousness. If they would trust in me instead of their works. Titus 3.5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So if we would trust in his work and not ours, he takes on our sin and washes away with his blood. And we can now stand there as if we never sinned because our sin is washed away. Isn't that an awesome plan that God came up with? Praise God, he came up with this plan. Thank the Lord. People complain and say, I don't like this one-way business. You ought to be grateful there is a way. Amen? And God made a way. This is the directions to heaven. Okay? John 3.36 says, He that has the Son has everlasting life. But he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. How do you know the Son? Two things. You have to repent of your sin. Luke 13.3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repent means to turn away from your sin. Walk away from it. It's not enough to just mentally assent to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to agree to walk away from your sin and say, Lord, I recognize I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I don't want to sin anymore. I, I want to walk and follow you if you repent of your sin. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved.